Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to this webinar about best practices for environmental detection and monitoring of SARS-CoV-2 and airborne viruses with the Coriolis air samplers. My name is Shantarium and I am your host today. In today's lecture, you will receive information about an innovative clone technology, giving air sampling a new dimension and creating possibilities for new applications for a safer environment. The lecture will be given by Sophie Dubac. She is a graduate graduated with a master's degree in biology and has worked as a life science application and product specialist at the Burton Technologies for more than five years. She was involved in the development and applications of the Coriolis uh, air sampler. Through her daily work, Sophie Dubac supports and advises users in their air quality control process. Our second speaker, who will give uh, you some tips and tricks and case studies, is Mariana Gaborion. Mariana is an application engineer at Bertin Technologies, and she holds a double PhD in environmental studies and in ecology and evolution. She has a great understanding of statistical modeling, bioinformatics, and molecular biology tools. But before we start the session, please let me inform that we will record this training. The recording will be sent to you after the session, but you can also always go back to our website and in the site uh, events, you will find all recordings of webinars we had and the webinars that we will hold in the future. We will also send you a certificate of attendees of attendance after the session. And um, for the questions, as we have a lot of people, uh, quite a lot of people joining, we would like to answer them at the end of the session. So you can submit them anytime and uh, we will pick them up at the end. Finally, may I also ask you to fill in the survey at the end of the session, because it's quite important for us to get your feedback. We always want to improve for the future. So this all said, I would like to give the word uh, to Sophie. Thank you all for joining. Hi everyone, my name is Sophie Dubac. Uh, I'm working at Bertin Technology and I'm happy today to present you um, the best practices for environmental detection and monitoring uh, of SARS-CoV-2 SARS and airborne viruses with our Coriolis air samplers. So within the agenda, I will start with a short presentation of our Coriolis air samplers. Then uh, Mariana uh, will uh, continue the session with some tips and tricks uh, on how to collect viruses. And as Jen mentioned, some case studies um, about uh, the collection of specific viruses with the Coriolis. Um, regarding uh, the Coriolis air samplers, I want to introduce briefly uh, who is Bertin Technology and um, the complete range that we have in life sciences uh, instrumentation. So Bertin Technologies uh, is an engineering company based in France uh, who offer different type of instrumentation and premium solution in life sciences. So today we will speak about our air samplers, the Coriolis, but we also um, promote uh, a sample preparation instrument, which is the Preselis, uh, which is able to homogenize any type of biological sample. We also have a huge range of biomarker detection and ELISA kits, and we also are able to manage some technology on demand if uh, you need to uh, uh, have a new instrument that is not existing in the market. Uh, regarding the Coriolis and the air sampling technology, Bertin is proud to have more than 15 years uh, of experience of weight cyclone technology. Um, the story begins uh, so more than 15 years ago with two projects, one uh, European project uh, which required to collect efficiently pollen in the air, and the second one uh, was uh, with the French army, uh, in 2006, which asked Bertin to develop an instrument which will be able to collect any biological warfare agent. 
such as pestis, anthrax, and tularemia. Uh, following these two projects, we decided to launch on the market uh, one instrument called the Coriolis Micro, so which is able uh, since 2009. Uh, it's a patented technology with a cyclone uh, which is able to collect the sample, the, any biological sample, and I will introduce you uh, in the next few slides um, the exact technology which is behind uh, the Coriolis Micro. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, two years ago, um, we launched the Coriolis Compact, uh, which is a new version of uh, the Coriolis uh, with a patented uh, dry cyclonic technology. And same thing, I will explain you a little bit uh, deeper the, the principle of the technology. Uh, regarding um, the the Coriolis, we have today a Coriolis everywhere around the world uh, in different topics and markets, as you can see uh, on this slide. So the Coriolis is really able to collect any type of biological sample, such as bacteria, fungi, toxins, allergen, pollen, and viruses. And as you can see, it can be used outside, indoor, in, or in any type of market, such as agro-food uh, market um, with the avian flu, for example, or uh, at the hospital, uh, if, if you need. Uh, and uh, Mariana will introduce you at the end of the presentation, so four case study uh, in four different environments. Regarding the technical information, you can find back uh, on this presentation the difference between the two Coriolis, the Coriolis Compact, which is a smaller, really light, only 1.5 kilograms, with eight hours of autonomy and an airflow of 50 liters per minute. Um, one of the main advantages of the Coriolis Compact is that you have a concentrated sample at the end as you collect uh, on a dry cone, so without any liquid. Uh, regarding the Coriolis Micro, um, the weight is uh, around uh, 2.8 kilograms. You have one hour autonomy of battery and the airflow can be higher than 50 liters per minute as you can go between 100 to 300 liters per minute. The main advantages of the Coriolis Micro is that you collect the microorganisms in a liquid, so it's compatible with viral culture, but also with um, classical microbiological culture. Regarding the technology, you can see here that um, the technology is a cyclonic technology meaning that when uh, you start the instrument, so with the Coriolis Micro, you put liquid in the cone, you start the instrument and there is an aspiration which is created. So a cyclone is created inside the cone and hair and particles enter into the cone and form a vortex. All the aspirated particles are centrifuged with the collection liquid in the cone. And uh, at the end, when you stop the instrument, all the particles are concentrated into the collection liquid. Regarding the Coriolis Compact, it's a dry cyclonic technology, meaning that you are working same thing with an aspiration. So when you start the instrument, aspirated air goes through the cones uh, and all the particles are retained in the cone wall but not in the liquid, as there is no liquid. At the end of the collection, you will recover all the particles by rinsing the cones, and Mariana will give you other tips um, big, um, inside this presentation. Regarding the importance of um, biocontamination and control of the indoor and outdoor air quality, we all be sure that um, the COVID-19 bring a new uh, vision of the air quality in terms of microbiology. Uh, if you see this uh, timeline, you can see that in only two years, uh, we really make a big step in terms of um, in, uh, indoor and outdoor air quality. 
uh, as you as we all know, uh, the first case of COVID-19 was reported uh, early in December 2019, and uh, we have the first paper about the use of the Coriolis micro for SARS-CoV-2 detection in June 2020. Today, we have more than 10 uh, papers mentioning the Coriolis micro uh, used uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 detection um, uh, during the, the pandemic. Uh, in terms of market and use, uh, if we are focusing only on airborne viruses, we know that it can be uh, really useful in the food industry, for example, to collect SARS-CoV-2, but not only, also to collect bacteriophages, for example, that we know affecting a production, meaning that if you have a contamination with bacteriophage, you know that you need to uh, throw away uh, all the production. Uh, also, we have a huge impact in the veterinary environment as the Coriolis compact can be used to monitor viral contamination of livestock in farms. Not only with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we know that uh, we had some avian flu pandemic um, in Europe uh, and uh, the Coriolis uh, compact was used uh, to follow this epidemic. Of course, we all know that uh, the main uh, environment where the Coriolis can be used in the, is in the health environment, uh, mainly to detect viruses in hospitals or nursing homes. Also, we, um, we want to protect uh, the workers and more and more um, it can be used in office spaces to uh, check the contamination, for example, or to assure a low level of contamination uh, in an office to uh, employees. Um, now I will let the words to Mariana for the tips and tricks, and she will uh, give you some uh, additional information on how to use the Coriolis to collect viruses in the air. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as Sophie just mentioned, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about how viruses are, well, as you can see in this image, transmitted through aerosols and how some simple tips and tricks could really help you optimize the protocol of air collection to, to have positive detection when you know there's a uh, virus in the air. Uh, so this is just to summarize how indeed the distance matters when you're when you're thinking on the protocol of collection for bioaerosols in general, but for viruses especially, uh, as they have a very small size, you know that the large infectious droplets are going to be very close to the subject uh, that is contaminated, and as you move farther away, then there's a higher risk of missing the detection uh, and getting a, a false negative. Then if we go to the next slide, we'll see some key points uh, to take also into consideration when we think of viral detection. Uh, there are some key challenges that must be taken into account as well to, to optimize our protocol of collections. Uh, as I just mentioned, we know that viruses are very small particles, so that, that is an intrinsic difficulty that we have to, to consider. And they are also quite fragile, so uh, we're going to have also difficulties to maintain their integrity and viability if we want to culture the, the virus afterwards. Uh, this has have some um, important connotations because these physical and biological challenges for the uh, efficacy of virus detection can lead to conclusions that have an impact directly to human health. Uh, as we saw in a systematic review that was funded by the World Health Organization that was published right at the beginning of the, well, right at the beginning of the pandemic, but it was kind of later based on the first publications that came at the beginning of the pandemic, that because it was very hard to recover viral culture samples of SARS-CoV, then we could not really have our main conclusions 
about the airborne transmission of the virus. So it's just to show how, how important these challenges and the efficacy of biological and physical detection of viruses are in optimizing and obtaining a good protocol for, for the collection of bioparticles in general. We also have to consider uh, other challenges, like we, <clears throat> besides the detection of the instrument itself and its efficacy, we have so many other uh, factors and variables that are playing in the environment. When we think about droplets that are being transported uh, around between the animal that is going to be probably infected from the environment or the transmission uh, from the animal to human or a reverse zoonotic case as well from humans to animals, just one of the cases that I'm actually going to, to discuss later on. Uh, so the intrinsic factors of each one of these players in the system, like age, sex, the immune system, the living style, behavior, uh, you name it, there are so many variables that we cannot control that also need to be considered in, in order to really make the best of our protocol and optimize it uh, as much as we can. So to, to sum up uh, some of the things as well, so all of these challenges are just when we're talking about the sampling strategy and how to define it. Uh, but we also have to consider that there's a whole workflow and steps that come afterwards, uh, after the sampling that have also, uh, an impact on the results that we're going to obtain. We have to take care of uh, how we are going to collect the sample, like in which media, which are the liquids that are going to really help. Us, uh, maintain the viability of the virus, for example, if that's what we're looking for. Uh, how we are going to store this sample after collection and the, and the decontamination procedures as well. So there's just to show you there's a whole workflow from sampling to analysis and many other steps that you should also be uh, thinking of before starting your project and, and being able to really come up with a plan that is going to help you obtain the results that, that you hoped. So in the next slide. We're going to start really pointing out some of the key uh, points for the best practices that we have identified. And this is coming from feedback from you, from like clients, researchers, and people that have used our instruments and have done the hard work and the field work. Uh, we've just tried to take them all in and summarize us to come up with a synthesis and, and some points that will help you in the future optimize your, your protocols faster. Um, so in terms of airflow rate, we usually recommend, we're talking about virus uh, in this moment, so we usually recommend an airflow rate of 200 liters per minute. That would be the ideal if you want to preserve the viability of the virus, if you're looking for uh, culturing afterwards. But we have also seen positive detection of viruses with a protocol of 300 liters per minute. Um, it, it, again, it really depends on the density of the virus in the air as well. So those are things that you might have, want to consider in the case of the Coriolis micro. Therefore, the Coriolis compact, the, the airflow rate is limited to 50 liter per minute and it's constant. So you cannot play with that. In that case, you can adjust the sampling duration. For that, uh, we consider that for the correlation of viruses, you should consider uh, sampling for at least 20 minutes, regardless of the airflow rate that you choose. Um, of course, depending on the air volume of the place where you're collecting, you might want to increase it even further than 30 minutes, but we consider that that should be like the minimum to, to be on the safe side of the positive detection and, and avoiding false negatives. Um, in terms of the position of the device, we have also noticed that it, it is a very important thing to consider during the protocol of collection. Uh, of course, we, as I mentioned before, because of the droplet size, uh, you want to be as close as possible if you're doing the 
detection from a contaminated subject in particular. But if you're just trying to sample a whole area, a whole room, then we would suggest to move the instrument during the collection of air, like start from the farthest distance away and move closer to the patient or subject. Uh, try to do multiple sampling points in that same room. So just to make sure that you're not just focusing on one spot where the air might not be flowing as much or you have a patch that is more concentrated than in other parts of the, of the room that you're sampling. Um, then again, talking about the sampling liquid, as I mentioned before, it's a very important uh, factor to consider. In terms of liquid for virus laden aerosols, we, we have found that PBS seems to work the best. Um, and this is the most commonly used one in the literature. Uh, we've will also seen results uh, that have been positive for detection of SARS-CoV using culture media uh MEM or DM as well. So <clears throat> the choice is still uh, very free for the detection of viruses and other biaerosols. On the other hand, uh, you should avoid most RNA shields uh, because they they have very high evaporation rates and when you're using a cyclonic airflow rate of over 200 liters for a long period of time, then you might find yourself with no liquid at all, or like your whole liquid might have been evaporated. So uh, there's something that, that you need to consider in the cases that you're starting with a liquid, like RNA later or something like that. Um, we do recommend for a uh, starting sampling volume, 15 milliliters generally, but you can adjusted between five and 15, depending again on the evaporation rate that you have in your environment. For the storage of the samples before transportation, then uh, as you know, for most samples to preserve the integrity of, of your nucleic acids, you should really store them as soon as possible, up to 24 hours at four degrees at least for short-term storage, and then of course for long-term uh, cryotubes and minus 20 or minus 80, depending on, on what you're trying to look for or try to uh, do on your downstream application. Um, then for processing of the samples, in the case of Coriolis Micro, because we are starting with a collection on liquid, depending on the volume that you started with, you're gonna find yourself probably with around 10 milliliters at the end of the collection time, uh, doing a classic 300 liter per minute during 10 minutes, um, if you started with 15 milliliters. So it's very flexible in that sense. And we do though, recommend that you centrifuge or reconcentrate your, your samples with a filtration device afterwards. That would really help you improve the, the yield of the molecule that you're looking for afterwards. Um, so just concentrate your sample as much as possible. There are different techniques, uh, as I mentioned. Then you can also start with a very short amount and repeating without readjusting the, the volume of liquid during the collection time. So then you'll find yourself with a very slow, uh, low volume. Uh, automatically just due to the evaporation. Uh, for the case of the Coriolis Compact, then it would be easier because you are collecting already on a dry cone, so it's really up to you to add the volume that you desire uh, with whatever liquid you desire as well. Um, what is going to be important then is to try to detach these particles that are kind of collapse against the walls of the cone, the interior walls of the cone, uh, so we recommend using either a swab that you can use to kind of scrub around the cone and re uh, resuspend all the cells in the liquid that you use for the recovery of your sample. Uh, we have also noticed or heard people that use uh, sonication as well to help detach the, the particles from, from the wall of the cone or simply vortexine or just shaking them up and down, that would also help you. It depends on what you have available at hand. 
when you're going to treat your sample. Then for analysis of the samples, all because you're recovering your sample finally on a liquid, either with the Coriolis micro or with a compact, then you really have a sample that will be compatible with all the rapid microbiology techniques or molecular biology techniques. Um, what it's also an advantage is that you could then use the same sample and divide it into several aliquots and you can do multiple analysis with the exact same sample. So that, that is something that could be really, uh, really useful. Um, in terms of decontamination, for the Coriolis micro particularly, that has uh, several pieces that are detachable. You can autoclave the cane and the air intake and the sampling cones. For the Coriolis compact, you cannot. The cones are only uh, single use only, so you just throw them away as a consumable. Um, you can also soak the detachable parts on a commercial bleach solution or on a solution of ethanol at 70%. And if you want a more thorough decontamination of the interior of the instrument as well, then we have tested that um, it can withstand the vapor of H2O2 uh, peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide, sorry. Um, so th that would not corrode the, the engine. And you can also, for those that do not have this technology, you can also try with the Coriolis Micro, you can run a cone filled with ethanol for 15 minutes at maximum speed to try to also decontaminate a little the, the interior of the instrument. So thank you, Mariana, for um, the tips and tricks presentation. Uh, we will now introduce you four different case studies, uh, so dedicated to viruses. But as you understand, uh, the Coriolis is also able to collect any type of uh, biological particles. Um, so today we will present uh, first uh, a study around uh, SARS-CoV-2 in hospital. Um, the second case study uh, uh, will be around the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by children attending school. Um, the third one, uh, as I mentioned, it will be in another environment as uh, it's the study of SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks in uh, naturally infected MIG farms. We all know that there was a huge topic uh, during the pandemic around the transmission uh, into MIG farms. Uh, and the fourth one uh, will be with another virus, which will be the norovirus, uh, during the, the toilet flushing and how um, the, the virus uh, spread uh, when you flush the toilet. Mariana, again, on, uh, on, uh, on your side. Thank you, Safi. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we'll start, as you saw before, uh, talking mostly about SARS-CoV-2 detection, but it's just a, as an example of how you can also detect other type of viruses. Uh, the first case study that we wanted to present to you is a very recent paper that just came out from Dr. Jacob Londell and Sarah Treson uh, about the detection of SARS-CoV-2 in hospitals. Uh, the effects of the different procedures that can generate aerosols in the hospital, um, the effect of EPA filtration units, the patient viral load, and physical distance. And we thank, of course, Dr. Jacob for sharing the results and, and letting us present it to you and share it with our community. So what they wanted to do in this study was really uh, to do kind of a sensitivity analysis. They wanted to identify different situations different characteristics of the patients, the environmental parameters, and the type of procedures that could generate aerosols. And all of that will be associated, and how all of that would be associated with airborne SARS-CoV-2 virus transmission. Uh, in order to do that, they carried out a very large uh, sampling scheme. They collected over 300 air samples around different uh, areas of the hospital, three infectious disease wards, uh, multiple intensive care units, three medical wards that were converted to COVID-19 units, and one emergency department. 
then they really uh, tested different distances from the, the patient's head in order to see the sensitivity uh, detection of the Coriolis from uh, less than one meter, between one and two meters, or, two, or between two and four meters from the patient's head. In terms of the protocol of collection, they were again using the Coriolis micro air sampler uh, at 200 liters per minute for 10 minutes, corresponding to the total of two uh, cubic meter of air. And they use as a solution 15 milliliters of PBS. For the analysis, it was like a uh, standard RT-QPCR after RNA extraction, of course. And what they found was that indeed 8% uh, of the samples uh, had positive detection of viral RNA. Of the 231 samples that they took from patient rooms, 10% were positive for SARS-CoV RNA. Then from the samples that were collected from other areas like work corridors were also positive, uh, three out of 51 samples. And even in the anterooms, they found one of the samples out of 15 that was positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Uh, they did not, however, detect the, the presence of viral RNA in the public areas of the hospital. So this paper, I think, would be very helpful for those of you who are interested in really optimizing your, your protocol of uh, collection for viral detection to, to really see the distances, the, the efficiency of collection, depending on many other characteristics that, that you can find typically in a hospital. Then we pass on, uh, we keep on the subject of SARS-CoV-2 detection, but now we're talking about schools and children. Uh, this was a very interesting paper that was published right at the beginning, I believe, of the, the well, that started right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was published, of course, a bit uh, later on. Uh, and it was on the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by children to contacts in school and their households as well. So it was a prospective cohort environmental sampling study that was carried out in London. They, they wanted to see how the virus was transmitted by children and young people to, in the school settings to outside of the school. So they actually collected air samples in the households as well of the infected children as well as in their schools. They collected uh, surface swabs as well in the same rooms that were uh, used to collect the air samples. And some environmental sampling also was carried out. All of that uh, every week for up to 28 days. Uh, they used uh, the Coriolis Micro for this analysis. Uh, their protocol of collection was 300 liters per minute during 10 minutes. And they also used 15 milliliters of PBS as the collection liquid. And uh, once more, the analysis was RT-QPCR after RNA extraction. In this case, they, they found that air samples were positive also in 50% of the homes that had symptomatic, symptomatic cases. So people who were shedding a moderate amount of uh, virus. These positive air samples were collected in the rooms where the children were playing or in a room where sorry, where the child had been playing and had just recently vacated. Then they found some air samples that were not positive in the homes of two asymptomatic cases, even though the viral shedding was high in one of those cases. So I forgot probably to mention, they were also taking um, samples on the child, the children themselves, to see if they were still uh, being positive for the detection of SARS-CoV with um, the regular detection techniques that we all use for quite a while now. Um, nonetheless, none of the samples was positive for culture afterwards. And so this was another case of SARS-CoV detection in schools. Now we're gonna move to the next slide where we're going to keep talking about SARS-CoV-2, but now using the Coriolis Compact and in a very different setting. 
This was uh, to document the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 in a naturally inflated mink, mink farm, uh, impact, transmission dynamics, genetic patterns, and environmental contamination. So the objective of the study was to investigate the SARS-CoV-2 infection outbreak in and what were some of the parameters associated with the transmission of the virus, the immunity, the pathology, and environmental contamination in these animal farms. For sampling, they were collecting uh, air and dust samples from different animal sheds in mink farms in Greece in February of 2021. So 113 and 30 days after the beginning of the outbreaks in farm A and farm B, respectively. And as I mentioned before, for the collection protocol, they used the Coriolis compact at a flow rate of 50 liter per minute for 25 minutes. And in this case, you can see, uh, and I find that it's a very useful paper for documenting the positioning of the air sampler um, relating to the position of the infected subject and the position of the different uh, infrastructure and the arrangement of the infrastructure in the in the environment. Uh, and again, for the analysis, it was RT-QPCR after RNA analysis. What they found was that indeed some of the samples were positive at farm A. Uh, sorry, farm, excuse me. At farm A, all of the samples that were collected in fixed spots were negative. And in farm A at day 30, the air samples that were collected while moving the instrument around were positive. All of the samples in the same farm that were collected from fixed spots were negative. And, and this is one of the papers uh, that we used to come up with the recommendations that I mentioned before, the importance of taking samples from different points in the same room or moving around while you are collecting the, the air sample as well. And for the final case study, now we, we move away from SARS-CoV detection and we're going to talk about the determination of murine norovirus aerosol concentration during toilet flushing. Uh, this was an interesting case, and we thank Dr. Boyles for, for letting us share the, the information with you. So what they wanted to do was to determine if toilet flushing is really a source of aerosol generation uh, using a surrogate murine virus, norovirus. In order to do that, they used a flushometer that was seeded with 50 milliliters of a solution of murine norovirus, diluted to different concentrations, so 10 to the power of five and 10 to the power of six PFU. Uh, and they conducted six trials consisting on 12 control samples, 12 aerosol samples, and six toilet water samples. And um, for the collection protocol, they used the Coriolis Micro at a rate of six, uh, sorry, 150 liters per minute for 30 minutes. And they used 15 milliliters of HPBS as a liquid solution. In this case, for the detection of the virus, they used digital PCR. And what we found is that uh, at the lowest concentration of the marine norovirus, none of the aerosol samples detected the presence of the, of the RNA of the virus. But that for the seeding concentration of 10 to the power of 6, the aerosol samples that were collected using the Coriolis micro were positive across all trials. Uh, with concentrations that range from 383 to 684 RNA copies per cubic meter. They also use different samplers and, and they compare the results between samplers as well. And as you can see on the table, the results that they obtained with the Coriolis Micro 
were, were the best. So that is just to show how uh, the Coriolis is a very efficient tool to detect and collect viruses, not only SARS-CoV, but really any type of airborne uh, viruses. Which is also reflected in this slide where we summarize briefly the number of publications that have been uh, coming out since 2010, the launch, uh, one year after the launch of the Coriolis Micro. Uh, as you can see on the graph on the left, it's been steadily increasing uh, with this jump on 2021, when you can see the proportion of the taxon that has been studied shifted really for from majority, ma majority uh, bacteria and fungi to now a very large proportion, almost half and half of virus detection compared to bacteria as well. So thanks, Mariana, that, for all. I will give back the word to Sophie. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mariana, for um, all the case studies. So uh, just one uh, one slide to conclude that the Coriolis is, is really easy to set up. And um, as you understand, uh, in only three steps, you can have uh, answers regarding the contamination the, in, in the air uh, with microorganisms. Um, the only thing I would say you need to do is uh, to collect your sample with the Coriolis, remove the cone and send it to the lab. And then um, what is the main advantage of the Coriolis is that you can analyze it uh, by any type of uh, analysis to have a sample um, fast results uh, of, your, of your collection. Um, I would like to thank everyone for the um, uh listening the webinar and so i think that now we will start uh the q a session uh we have few questions so but don't hesitate to keep uh continuing to answering your question in the uh in the specifics box um we have some specific questions so we will contact um uh the people after the the meeting but for some uh, global question. We have one question um, regarding the decontamination. Uh, can you recommend a validate procedure for decontamination of the instrument with H2O2 showing effective inactivation of DNA? Um, so, Mariana, I will answer this one. So, yes, we have a specific protocol uh, to give to you uh, regarding the H2O2 uh, decontamination uh, on the instrument. There is a specific mode that you can activate uh, to, to do the decontamination uh, within the H2O2. So it's, I will say, easy if you have uh, the installation that you, uh, in your lab with H2O2 vapor, uh, meaning you have a specific, um, uh, you, you already are able to use H2O2 vapor. You just need to select the good, um, the 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 good uh, menu uh, in the in the Coriolis and then launch the protocol and we can give you uh, the time and level of H2O2 uh, without um, any issue. Um, we have one question regarding the collection liquid. So it seems that some people can have issue uh, with the PBS as it uh, presents some salt. Uh, but uh, the other, if I regroup all the questions regarding the collection liquid, um, so uh, Mariana, what type of liquid collection should be used to collect the COVID-19 or any type of other particles? Yeah, so it, it will depend if, as I showed you with the multiple case studies, PBS is really one of the most commonly used. Uh, it is true that it contains salt, so you have to be careful in terms of the evaporation rate to not let it evaporate as much. So I would suggest that if you need to concentrate all of your sample, then start with a small volume to begin with. That would allow you to uh, not have to run as much as a longer collection time that would then increase the risk of maybe accumulating salts inside of the, of the engine. Um, but then if you're looking for culturing 
viruses, then I would suggest that you do not use PBS and you start with a, a culture liquid media directly. Okay, thank you, Mariana. Uh, we have another question. Have you other example of viral collection other than SARS-CoV-2 uh, detected in patient rooms at the hospital? That is a good question. Um, actually, no, from the moment in hospitals, the only virus that have been studied using the Coriolis ha has been the SARS-CoV-2, uh, but I do know of a recent publication that just came out and we're going to have uh, coming shortly also an application note about it. Um, it's the detection of many type of viruses, uh, waterborne viruses on a wastewater treatment plant. So I think we do not have a case specifically inside a patient room, but we do have the, the protocols and, and the proven recommendations on how to detect any other type of viruses that are uh, aerosolized in the air. So I, I think at the hospital, I don't know all the publication as Mariana uh, show you, there is a lot, but I think we have uh, several publication around um, the syncytial virus, viruses so we have some, uh, not specifically in patient room, but at the hospital, we, we have several publications around vi these viruses also. Um, so if I uh, go back to other question, uh, just let me check. Um, so we have question around the cones. Would the cones are reusable or made of plastic or glass? Yes, so the cones in both cases for the Coriolis micro and the compact are made of plastic. Uh, but in the case of the Coriolis micro, they are autoclavable. You can reuse them uh, for a limited number of times, of course, because you can imagine the plastic is going to brittle over time. So eventually you want to change them and replace them. Um, in the case of the Coriolis Compact, they are single use only. So you cannot, you cannot autoplay them. Thank you, Mariana. We have another question regarding, um, okay, how you, um, how you, you take out the cone, uh, is it dangerous and do you need specific protective um, PPE or how do you manage the, the, the cone here? Uh, so I would suggest as with any other case study, you follow the rules of the place where you're working with. Uh, so in a lab and if you are dealing with potentially pathogenous uh, viruses or bacteria, then yes, of course, I would recommend the use of, of PPE, uh, but just because out of best practices uh, on, on a lab, there's really very limited risk of contamination once you unscrew the cone to recover your sample. Uh, in the case of the collection on liquid, then uh, re aerolization of the, of the particles is gonna be very, very minimal. So, I do not think that would be necessary in that case. Okay. And same in the case of the Coriolis compact, the, the cap size and the particles are going to be very uh, kind of, I'm not going to say attached because there's nothing really keeping them, them physically <laughs> there. But the risk again of aerolization, it's quite minimal. I was just suggest that you keep following the, the best practice rules that you do when dealing with, with the type of organism that you're studying. No, no special need to, to take care of add another layer just because of this type of collection. Um, thank you. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, so finally, is it better to collect viruses in liquid with the Coriolis micro or on dry way with the Coriolis Compact? I think it's a good question to, to finish yeah. the session. <laughs> it is a good question. And it's one that I, I get quite a lot um, also from technical advice. Um, so for the detection itself, if you are looking for detection presence or absence of RNA, viral RNA, 
either way will be compatible uh, with the Coriolis Compact on a dry collection or with the Coriolis Micro on a liquid. Then the only issue will be if you are looking for culturing the virus, then yes, I would recommend that you do the collection on a liquid directly using the Coriolis Micro. Okay, thank no, I think you you answer uh, perfectly. Oh, and just one last question. Um, is there, uh, so we mentioned a lot indeed uh, PCR for, for detection of virus. Uh, is there any information available on recovery in on, of infection viruses recoverable in cell culture? Uh, in so, I mean, in cell culture, like the aerialization or... Yeah, so I, if, if I may, um, indeed, uh, the majority, as you mentioned, the majority of the paper doesn't try to uh, cultivate the virus uh, with, um, uh, with, with the cell culture. Uh, we know it's possible. In this case, uh, Coriolis micro will be the best because we know that having uh, the virus during a long time without any um media it it will um damage too much the virus to to be uh so uh, alive uh, and and be able to infect viruses um the um, the main thing to keep in mind to to culture viruses is that um protocol will will need to be optimized uh, we you will need to find uh, the best uh, combination uh, between uh, which type of uh, liquid you are using, uh, what is the best uh, time and uh, the best airflow uh, to collect the viruses. Uh, we know it's doable because we have several users that are doing it. Uh, it's not yet published, so we, add, we don't have the details about the protocol, but um, it's, uh, it's doable if you know uh, how to uh, how to manage viruses uh, also after the collection. Yeah, and if I may add just quickly, uh, as an alternative for culturing viruses, you can also use uh, viability PCR. Um, it's still in development, the technology, but there's an option where you can use PMA to tag the viable cells in your sample, and then you can detect the RNA that is really coming only from the viable cells in your sample. So that could be an option as well. Okay, thank you, Mariana. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, all the participants and uh, VWR Adventor to invite us to uh, to do the this uh, this webinar and be able to share with you um, the the protocols uh, with our instrument. Um, thank you all. Have a good uh, afternoon and uh, hope to see you soon. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you thank to you. Uh, Sophie and uh, Mariana and have a very nice evening, all of you. Uh, for the attendees, uh, it would be great if you could uh, fill in also the, re the follow up in the survey so that we can uh, have a look on, on uh, your thoughts about this webinar. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Bye.